Good morning, everyone. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here to give you this talk. Now, if you look at your program, I've got a title that says talk, I can't take a deep breath. So if you compare it to all the other titles, they're all complicated, with meaningful messages. So this is the real title. All right, I'm going to talk about how to manage life-threatening or near-fatal asthma in the ED. Before I begin, I have no disclosures to make. I will drive what I'm going to talk about by looking at a case study. So this is a real patient that I'll talk about. We will look very little, just a little bit, into, patho, into the pathophysiology of this disease. I will mainly focus on the ED management, and this is an important talk for the residents because this is directed at you. And for everybody else, I hope you can pick up some clinical pearls on how to manage this condition. Two key things I want to talk about. Number one, DSI. What is DSI, you ask me? I will cover this in little detail. And the second thing, adrenaline. This is my favorite drug, adrenaline. And I'll talk a bit more detail on this. So we begin with a case. This is a real patient. I saw this patient in March of 2013, so just over a year ago. It was in the middle of the night. I was on night duty. I was in the VSAS room. And the SEDF VHF coded a breathless patient for standby. So this patient had a history of bronchial asthma as well as diabetes. She was apparently well before bedtime, so no prior symptoms. But while she was sleeping, she developed sudden onset shortness of breath. <coughs> when the paramedics got to her, they noted bilateral wheezing. Her SpO2 as seen was 82% on room oxygen, sorry, on room air, is 21%. So they appropriately treated her as for acute asthma and they started her nebulizer therapy, driven it with the oxygen tank as per protocol, brought her to the hospital as quickly as possible. Now, on the way to the hospital, the patient became drowsy and they noted some seizure like activity. So we received the patient in the research room. The patient was attended, she was unable to obey commands. She was obviously struggling to breathe. You can see that she has paradoxical abdominal movement. Importantly, she had a silent chest. There was no significant air entry that you can hear on auscultation. These were the vital signs. Air febrile, tachycardic, the kidney, a little bit hypertensive, a little bit elevated blood sugar, but most importantly, the SpO2 by now, bowel on nebulizer treatment, was less than 50%. And that's the reason why she's having a CEO, still do hypoxia. So the very first thing that I'll cover is how to recognize this condition. And we'll go into a little bit of pathophysiology. So all of us know about severe asthma. The patient will be seated upright. Usually, they will be unable to speak. They cannot manage the full sentence. They will either be words or short phrases. Some of them won't be, even, won't be even able to talk. If you measure peak flow, it will be less than 40% less predicted. Very often, it may be hypoxic, but this is easily corrected with oxygen. Take note of this point, because patients with severe asthma do not have significant intrapulmonary shunting. So they should usually correct easily with oxygen. Now, as the patient gets worse and worse and they approach near fatal asthma, sometimes things get a little bit tricky, especially if you do not have pre-hospital history. So this patient, they can have a quiet chest, so if you don't think about it, you don't look for it, you might mistake it for something else. The patient will be confused because of hypercarbia. The patient can have a decreased level of consciousness because of that. And if there's a, another issue complicating the patient or if it is in extremis in near the rest when hypotension and bradycardia set in, then it, it may be difficult to recognize. The next thing that we need to be aware of is that there are essentially two phenotypes, two, two distinct patterns of presentation in patients with near fatal asthma. There's the gradual onset, counting for about 80 to 85 percent, and the sudden onset, about 15 to 20 percent. In the gradual onset group, it is slow to start. Symptoms usually start days to weeks before. 
there is moderate to severe airflow obstruction. And this is based on autopsy studies of patients who have died from near fatal asthma. They find that these patients have significant air wall, airway wall edema, there's mucus plugging, and a significant mucus gland hypertrophy. These people are slow to respond to treatment. So if you see patients like this, you will call them status asthmaticus. Um, the other group is sudden onset. So it develops within minutes to hours. It is usually characterized by acute bronchospasms. And the toxic studies of people who died in this group, they have near normal airway pathology. Near normal. There's neutrophilic infiltration in their airways. These people are characterized by a faster therapeutic response and they have a shorter hospital stay. And there are a variety of names that you can call this condition. You can call them the acute permanent asthma, the aesthetic asthmatics, or some authors call them the lock lung syndrome. Not right, exactly like that. So the next key thing to recognize if it's a patient like this is that inhaled therapy will not work. So back to our patient, she was on nebulizer therapy, it was driven by oxygen, and her sets just kept getting lower. Okay, inhaled therapy will not work in this patient. Why? Because there is hardly any airflow. These people are in hyperdynamic, hyperinflation dynamic hyperinflation, so there's very low airflow, so it will not work. If you do give inhalational therapy, do recognize that only about 10% of nebulized drug will actually reach your bronchial. This is based on healthy volunteer studies. All right? So what do we do? Do we intubate this patient right away? No, that half of all life-threatening complications will occur at or around the time of intubation. And a large proportion of this mortality, by mortality, morbidity, is actually due to the mechanical ventilation itself rather than the disease process. So we know we should not avoid intubation. And I'll just show you an example of a guideline. This was from where I did my uh, fellowship in critical care ultrasound. Ruben Strayer, you may be familiar with him, he is the curator of tmupdates.com, Robert Antel. Uh, one of my good friends is the editor of the EM Emergency Medicine Practice Critical Care Series. And he came up with this guideline. So I don't want to boil the details, but the most important thing highlighted in yellow in the center is avoid intubation if possible. So that is actually a true axiom, and you've got to remember that. So if you can't intubate the patient at that time, what do you do? You rescue them. So this is the part of my talk where I'll talk about two things. So BSI stands for Delayed Sequence Intubation. Delayed Sequence Intubation. And we'll talk on parenteral rescue, how to salvage this patient. So BSI, Delayed Sequence Intubation, what is it? In a nutshell, it is a new paradigm in every management. In my opinion, I think if, if any emergency tech, medicine textbook that's going to come out from 2011 onwards, it should sort of include these principles in managing airway in the emergency department. And this is the key article that described this. And I think this was mentioned by Dr. Colin Parker earlier on. This was, came out in 2011, written by Dr. Scott Weingart. Most of you will know him. One of the best medical blogs in the world currently, emcrate.org. That's him. That's him. <laughs> All right, so what is, what is DSI? It breaks down the components of the traditional rapid sequence intubation. It is goal-directed, right? So we have goal-directed sepsis care, goal-directed cardiac arrest care. This is goal-directed airway management. It focuses on oxygenation as a goal because it recognizes that hypoxia is what kills patients. I'll say that again, hypoxia is what kills patients. And if you practice this on high-risk patients, you really do reduce the risk of complications and you reduce the risk of peri-intubation, cardiac arrest, or collapse. So what are the techniques that's been described in this paper? Non-invasive ventilation is now used as a tool for pre-oxygenation. Okay, and this is especially important if there's shunt physiology happening, left to right shunt, because that's the predominant cause of hypoxia in emergency medicine departments. 
So instead of using back valve mask ventilation, in a heightened anxiety state, everybody will do this, and we've seen that demonstrated earlier in the keynote by Dr. Dan Davis. So we use the ventilator to replace mask ventilation, and if you know how to sell your ventilator properly, you can deliver proper ventilation without that significant bagging where you increase the risk of gastric insufficiency. Phenomenon of ethnic oxygenation, this was talked about a little bit earlier. So this is to give intranasal oxygen in these patients so that you give them a delayed time to desaturation, or if you do it well, no desaturation at all during intubation. So what we are doing is we are delaying intubation until we are well and ready to intubate the patient. So PSI, in a nutshell, it is using carefully selected anesthetic drugs in the right doses. We are using these to prepare the patient for pre-oxygenation. In the meantime, we will support the ventilation if it's needed. In the meantime, we can treat underlying pathology, as in our patient. And if the person has circulatory shock, for example, we can treat the circulatory shock with push those presses so that when we intubate them, they will be safe. And when we do decide to paralyze and intubate the patient, sometimes you'll find that the patient recover enough so that you actually you can stand down from intubation. Next, when we practice BSI to support our ventilation, support our patient, pre-oxygenate them, it is time to reverse the pathology. So now I'll talk about rescue medication. And as mentioned, adrenaline is my favorite drug. Now, I understand adrenaline has a bad reputation, okay? It causes tremors, palpitations, sweatiness, paleness, and frightened patient in pending sense of doom. That's all been described. It causes dysrhythmias, it causes heart attacks. So, you've got, you will hear your senior physician tell you, all right, please, uh, in this anaphylactic shock patient, just give a bunch of fluids, give them glucosamine. I've seen this before, and it still happens, I think. All right, for example. Understand that most of the adverse events described in the literature actually comes from overdosage of adrenaline. If you look at the majority of adrenaline adverse events and deaths, it's due to that. And that comes from anaphylaxis. Okay, if you look at actual myocardial infarction in the setting of therapeutic adrenaline doses, we're just talking about f probably five, around five, maybe a bit more reported cases. And these were young patients, aged from about 29 to 55. These were all FD elevation MIs. These patients all had normal coronary arteries. So the, the possible mechanism is probably coronary vasospasm, and just due to a triggering by the adrenaline. Okay, so MI in a setting of Adrenaline use is a very rare event, okay? In older patients, I believe that if you give adrenaline in the, select, the, the properly selected older patient, you actually can improve the coronary blood flow, okay? All right. So this didn't come out so well. This is a study coming out from the 80s. Um, Signal Center, the emergency department, it's a study on all patients presenting with acute asthma from a single center in the department in the 80s. So what they did was they only gave subcutaneous adrenaline, 0.3 mils of a 1 in a 1,000 concentration to these patients up to a maximum of 4 doses every 20 minutes, 20 minutes of time. Right? So if patients presenting with acute asthma, they will get subcutaneous adrenaline. Exclusion criteria will include if you have chronic obstructive lung disease, if you have AMI in the past three months, or you have symptoms of vagina. And this study actually demonstrates more about looking at adverse events of adrenaline in the older adults. And they do find that between the young patients and the old patients, similar incidence of either atrial or ventricular arrhythmia. And we are not really talking about significant arrhythmias. What they described, the most common obviously was sinus tachycardia. The next most common was the ventricular ectopics. So it happens both in the old and in the young patients as well. Old patients probably have a slightly higher incidence of atrial arrhythmias, and we're talking about things like atrial ectopics, a couple of SVTs. So nothing that was too alarming. So how do you dose adrenaline? The first thing to know is that 
one milligram of adrenaline is for dead birth people. Alright, so you only give these people for dead. Right? In cardiac arrest. Right? So to dose adrenaline properly, you need to know how to dose it. So this is, if you do not have vascular access, this is following the anaphylaxis guidelines. You give either intramuscular or subcutaneous adrenaline, 0.3 mils of a 1 in 1,000 solution, solution or 0.3 milligrams. You can do that. If you have vascular access, how I will dose it, I will give push pressor boluses, 10 micrograms every 2 to 3 minutes. You can set up a dirty epi drip. So this comes from the folk at the academic life in emergency medicine.com. What you can do, half a meal or 0.5 milligram of one in a thousand solution, inject it into a 500 mil saline bag. On the US, I understand they have one liter bag, so you just one valve in one liter, but here we're using 500 mil bags. So the, the constitution is one microgram per gram. And if you can calculate your drop factor, if you get one to two drops per second, that equivalents to about four to eight mics per minute. Alright, so you can do that quickly without the nursing, nurses having to set it up for you. And that's so that when you do set it up the actual infusion, you can then switch over. Right, so this is how you would get adrenaline. <coughs> the next rescue medication I use, and this is more as an adjunct, is ketamine. Now, we are familiar with properties of ketamine. It is an old anesthetic drug. It's been around for a long time and we are well aware of its motodilator properties. Right, that's why it's people that make both out. So there are numerous reports that suggest ketamine is useful because of its motodilator properties. It's rescuing these people. This is one such case report. So this patient has acute severe asthma. He whom's the author want to intubate. So what they did, they gave a dissociative dose of ketamine to these patients, followed by a ketamine infusion. And just watch the patient, and give the patient the naps and standard therapy. And instead of needing to intubate this patient, they found that the bronchospasms were actually relieved. Okay, and this has been described many times. So ketamine, in the context of delayed sequence intubation, is useful. It allows the patient to calm, to be dissociated if necessary. And in the meantime, we, we are just using this bronchodilator effect. So how do we dose ketamine? <laughs> Two ways that I, I do it. First is the analgesic dose, which is 0 0.1, mm, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 milligrams per kilo intravenous. And if you are going for a full dissociative dose, you will give at least 1 milligram per kilo. So if your patient is unconscious, minimally struggling, I usually start with the first analgesic dose, just to keep them calm, relax, take away a bit of their pain. It is a strong analgesic that you do. If you're struggling and need to put on NIV, you can give the full dissociative dose. In the meantime, while I'm rescuing the patient, I just want to mention this briefly. Don't forget other adjuncts, steroids, magnesium sulfate. Okay, this medicine will probably help later on, but not immediately. So back to the case. What do we do? So the patient on the NAPS is not working. We pre oxygenate the patient. And how do we do this? We use two sources of oxygen, put on intranasal prongs, and put the patient on a non rebreather mask. In the meantime, we will prepare our intubation equipment. For departments that uses checklists, please do use your checklist. Prepare your LMA, prepare your cricotherodotomy set. And this is what we did essentially. We gave the patient push pressure doses of adrenaline, 10 micrograms, for the first 15 minutes or so, every two to three minutes. I started her on some IV adrenaline over about an hour, the low dose 10 micrograms per minute. At about 10 to 15 minutes, we dosed her, keep her comfortable, IV ketamine 10 milligrams. And the other IV, the standard, we give her fluids, because she will need it, some hydrocortisone, and infuse, infuse, infusion of magnesium sulfate. So after 15 minutes, we do know that she had good clinical response, and we know that because now the wheezing is audible before the stethoscope. Right, so from a silent chest, she now starts properly wheezing. Okay, so we managed to take out the non revealer mask and substitute it with a continuous next three cycles, 20 minutes each. And she was maintaining the saturation as well. And this is just with intranasal oxygen. So after about 90 minutes, patient now becomes awake. She's able to obey commands. She has good vital signs. 
to just now using good peak flow, then I managed to convince the ICU registrar that we can manage this patient in the inpatient ward, not in the ICU. So we have her to a general ward, which is out by day three. Out by day three. All right. I'll show you this set of cases. <coughs> this is not the same patient. This is a patient we rescued last month. The registrar is sitting right here. He is the one that did this. So we ran the same sequence. Now this patient did respond as well. So we started the patient in the of NIV. Then we got a blood gas. Then we proceeded to incubate this patient. This is the PAO2 goal that I was talking about. This is to prevent desaturation. So that this is before incubation, severely acidotic due to hypercarbia. Post incubation, once we got the R in, we managed to get the PACO2 down and down. And look at the timings. Okay, I'll tell you that when we intubated her, we ventilated her with a respiratory rate of 20. 20. And that's because we have relieved most of the bronchospasms. And this is just by increasing the tidal volume. This is from 6 mils per kilo, this is at 7 mils per kilo. By 9 p.m. in the ICU, the blood gas was near normal. Patient was excavated the next day, discharged by day 4. Alright? So in summary, if you have a similar case, please remember, delayed sequence incubation, parental rescue. Thank you very much. Need to ask the question later, you can send it to my Twitter handle here. You can email it. Don't forget to put the hashtag SAMS2014. References, and finally, it will put up at the, the web blog that some of us, me and some of my colleagues, are contributing to. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, I just wanted to ask in your personal experiences, giving ketamine slow down the respiratory rate to the extent that it may worsen the outcome. Okay. <coughs> That's a good question. If you're worried, um, at analgesic doses, it will not. Okay? Even at dissociative doses, it is unlikely to. Uh, there's some contra slight controversy in that, depending on the literature that it should be. But I don't think... Because ketamine should not reduce respiratory. It should not be pressed for <coughs> And in the pediatric literature, it is shown as well. Mm -hmm.